Recall that the normal acceleration is telling you how tightly your curve is turning, and this is related to that constant kappa and the important notion of the curvature of a curve. So given a curve, gamma in Rn, the curvature is denoted kappa of t, and it measures how much the curve bends. Now, here's a more formal definition. It is the angular rate of change of the unit tangent vector with respect to arc length, L, of the curve. So kappa of t can be defined as the length of the rate of change of the unit tangent vector uh, with respect to arc length, L. Now, normally you don't have an arc length parameterized curve. If you want to compute the derivative with respect to the time parameter, then uh, with a simple application of the chain rule, you can see that what you need to do is divide out by dl dt. Now, what really matters here is the intuition, namely that a curvature that is small means you have a very flat curve. A curvature that is large means you have a, a much tighter curve. Now, this formula is a fine definition, but it's not so easy to use in practice. But if you're in 3D, you can use the 3D cross product to simplify things and show that the curvature is the length of the velocity cross the acceleration vector divided by the speed cubed. That is the normal component of the acceleration divided by the speed squared. Okay, now all of these formulae, all of these definitions, you don't really need to memorize these. Um, what I really care much more about is the intuition behind curvature. And here's a fun way to think about it. The unit tangent vector is telling you something about the best fit line to a curve, whereas the curvature and the unit normal vector are telling you something about the best fit circle to a curve. So this is um, a little reminiscent of things that we did in Taylor series with higher order approximations. And a best fit circle is something like a, a second order approximation to the curve. And that best fit circle has radius equal to the reciprocal of the curvature. The circle is called the osculating circle, and it's pretty cool. It is a circle whose center is the position on the curve, r of t, plus what? Well, you move in the direction of the normal vector by an amount 1 over kappa of t. That 1 over kappa is the radius of the osculating circle, or if you like, the osculating radius. Now again, don't be intimidated by the formulae associated with curvature. That stuff can get pretty hairy. What I really care about, what I think is most interesting about curvature, is how it's telling you about second order approximations to a curve. And for this purpose, uh, thinking about visualizing the osculating circle and how it relates to the tangential and normal components of acceleration, how it relates to curvature, that's where the real interesting stuff is happening. That's worth your time and attention. Memorizing formulae for curvature, um, not so much. We should probably do an example or two, maybe a homework problem, and then move on. So here's a simple example involving computation of curvature of a plane curve. Now let's say you have a curve that's given by a hanging cable, and that's the graph of some function. Some, whoa, what function is that? Oh my gosh. Oh right, I remember, hyperbolic trig functions. If you don't recall those, you might want to take a few moments, go back, review your hyperbolic sine, hyperbolic cosine. We're going to need those, remembering that the formula for the hanging cable is given by a hyperbolic cosine, or cosh. If we parameterize this curve in the simplest way possible, using t for the x-coordinate and cosh t for the y-coordinate, then it's easy to take derivatives to get velocity and acceleration, remembering that the derivative of cosh is cinch, and the derivative of cinch is cosh. Now, these are giving me vectors in the plane. I can think of them as vectors in 3D by just adding a zero uh, for the third z component. In that way, I can compute 
the cross product of the velocity vector with the acceleration vector, plugging in what we have, and then taking the length of that, then dividing by the speed cubed. This is going to give me, very easily, a cosh t in the numerator, and then in the denominator, what I need to do is compute the length of v. That's going to be square root of 1 squared plus cinch squared, and then cube that. Now you may recall the hyperbolic trig identity that says that 1 plus cinch squared equals cosh squared. That means we can replace that denominator by cosh cubed, and now I have a cancellation between the hyperbolic cosine in the numerator and the three hyperbolic cosines in the denominator. That leaves me with 1 over cosh squared, which is, I don't even know how to pronounce that, that's a hyperbolic secant squared. Now, go back, review your hyperbolic secant, and see if it makes sense. Where is the curvature maximized? Is this curvature always non-negative? Have we gotten something that makes sense? And the answer is, yes, we have.